and I'm gonna stay for <laughs> for this this weird stuff. All right. So um, uh, yes, thank you so much for staying for this uh, third part of this presentation. Um, here we can actually you can influence how this wanna how this is gonna gonna flow. Like if you wanna do like hands on, you can do like typey typey with me or like sh me doing something and you do something with me. Um, really, really up to you. I would like to do some introductions on the things so to set the context. We will already have a plenty of context today though, um, but I still wanna do um, um, some of the things in particular to this topic. So uh, my name is Victor. I work in Confluent called Confluent. Uh, how many of you heard about Confluent before you came in today? Great. Uh, for those of you who don't know, like I see some people, uh, the Confluent, uh, what we do, we have our distribution of, uh, we call it streaming platform based on Apache Kafka, it's called Confluent Platform. Um, after a certain time when they, you know, we, we start doing things around the Kafka and was founded by founders of Kafka, when they start doing some of the projects in different organizations, they realize that there's some things that are missing in overall um, Apache Kafka project. So they start building these uh, missing parts specifically some of the things around uh, data governance, for example. We're going to be talking about schema registers today. It's kind of one of the uh, like a first building blocks that you want to do introduce in your organization once you need to build this um, kind of like a common hub of data information that your microservices will be using to exchange. Um, also, we want you to run your streaming platform whenever you want regardless of your platform, except Windows. Uh, <laughs> um, it's a long story about this. But hey, no one runs production on Windows, right? No, no? good, good stuff. I'm in a good group, so sometimes people say, wait, what, what do you say? Like someone in, uh, some in um, say, Kentucky area. Like, <laughs> those people running Windows in production a lot. Um, yeah, so this, right, this joke didn't land there. Um, <laughs> essentially, uh, regardless, if you're running this on the bare metal, if you're running this on your laptop, if you're running this in cloud, uh, if you're running this on Kubernetes, uh, we support all these uh, types of deployments um, as a like as a part of our platform, providing tools, we're providing uh, software, we're providing different things like even like YAML scripts. Ansible people here, no? In anyone? Yes, one one person. Um, the essentially like whatever you need to do, moving data around, we have a replicator that allows you to um, replicate some of the data from one place to another. We have a monitoring solution. You've seen the glints of this one, and I'll show you how we can use this not only as a monitoring solution but as your developer tools. Um, we are we build a probably the best uh, cloud uh, provide, uh, cloud managed service uh, for Apache Kafka in the streaming platform. That includes um, not only Kafka. How many of you know that the Apache Kafka actually has a multiple different components like uh, Kafka Connect? How many of you heard about Kafka Connect? Okay, good stuff. Um, how many of you heard, probably you already heard today about Kafka Streams? So all these three components, they're actually creating this uh, the bare minimum for streaming platform. You have a, the system that allows you to distribute your, your data. Um, you have a system, it's Kafka, uh, you have a system that allows you to bring data in, bring data out, uh, it's a Kafka Connect, and you have a system that allows you to um, do some processing. Um, so essentially, yeah, I work with this company, and this is exciting uh, part of my work when I go and talk to people. Um, I like to listen, so that's why I would like to also have a conversation with you folks today, like whatever you feel like uh, from developer standpoint, from operation standpoint, monitoring standpoint, for any type of day one, day two type of problems that you might have, I would love to hear. Um, part of my job being developer advocate, it's not like I'm an evangelist and I just go and like buy our shit. Yes, please do, but I'm also here to advocate for you in, inside the organization. We work with product and engineering. We are, as a developer ex uh, experience team, developer relations team inside Confluent, we are trying to be kind of like developer zero. Engineers, they will build stuff. You know, they smart people, they will building the features, closing Jira's and blah, blah, blah. But is it useful? Is it uh, something that people can easily understand how it works and things like that? This is our responsibility, this is what I do. Also, before, I always forgetting this, I'm some, for some reasons like putting this on the very last thing. 
like if you need to go uh, earlier, if you need to or you miss something, this is the most important slide that you probably need to have. Um, this slide will include code of the workshop and this is slide includes all this like narrative, which is essentially a playbook so you can go tomorrow, be in your happy place um, maybe and uh, go through this workshop and refresh some of the ideas and then saying, oh yeah, that was actually useful. So yeah, if you're into QR code type of game, please um, also use this one. But like this is like short links where you can find the code. It's GitHub and this is a um, for full full uh, full blown text. I built highly scalable, highly available Hello World application. So this is essentially your in this code that we're going to be talking today. It is highly scalable and highly available Hello World application because it runs on highly scalable platforms like uh, like uh, Cloud Foundry. Um, this application will be using uh, Spring Boot as a framework of choice. Um, but there's a kind of trick here. So you can use whatever framework you like. Um, if you uh, a Java developer or maybe some other language developer, specifically JVM language developer, any Scala developers here? Good, nice. It's good, a good audience. Um, any Kotlin uh, developers maybe? Nice, yes, that's definitely my people here. So essentially, um, you, can, you can use the different uh, frameworks for writing stream processing applications. Um, as, again, as the things that we do in Confluent, we also develop um, and support uh, the bindings or libraries for different languages. We support um, C version, .NET version, Go version, Python version, um, based on the C library that we support and develop uh, lots of open source community uh, people, they use this as a foundation for their libraries for Rust, for Node.js, and many others. So different libraries using uh, different um, bindings. So this is what we do also as a part, as a part of the company. Now, uh, we're going to be talking about um, some of the microservices stuff. And like your code, uh, when it's small, concise, um, it's very easy, it's very nice. It's very clean. You enjoy to just look into the into this one, just like one module. But over the time, you start building multiple things around this module, right? So it may be different components. They need to perform different responsibilities. Uh, over over the time, your code base is growing really, really quickly, and uh, you're getting larger success, bringing more people. They're building stuff more and more. Now it's getting a little bit darker place. So this is where we're going into maybe like five years of you know, the software project. Everything is like different teams uh, put their hands here. Um, there's become even worse because you can find some of the code that's actually dead um, and no one is using or because no one knows what is, uh, what is going on there. So this is your chief architect where uh, he's trying to do onboarding for new developers. He's explaining all this. Uh, how many of you watching the It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia? And uh, how many of you have seen this episode of uh, Pepe de Silva? Uh, Pepe de Silva? Okay, great. So this, essentially, the Charlie, uh, Charlie Day's character was trying to investigate uh, the story of this uh, person, uh, Pepe de Silva, and uh, he's trying to build different things across the organization. This is essentially your chief architect trying to find the ways how different components uh, uh, communicate. So it's time to do some refactoring, right? So we're going to be doing the, the big time clean up all this mess. Uh, refactoring through microservices. Um, idea of microservices is easy. You need to start, again, move everything from the head of one person that almost impossible to include everything about the system in the head of one person um, well, to something where uh, everyone can understand what is going on there. So, like time uh, the, the, the back in the day, everything was very easy. There's not much uh, going on, but still, a lot of things going on. Well, it's they good. You know, we we know how to write those. You know how to write those. Uh, everything in one place. You don't need to go and uh, look around. You can always kind of search in the code. However, it's something that it's very difficult to think about because there's multiple contexts. Some of the contexts may, may be intersect uh, to, with each other. Um, and 
in more important, it's very difficult to change, right? So because there's multiple components, you don't know what dependency one component depends on another. It's good if you have, uh, if you've been over the time, like a good person, good engineer, you're implementing all the practices, including test-driven design, test-driven development, you have a test coverage, even maybe not unit testing, but at least like you have an integration testing in places. So you, you, you're good here, but there's still places where some of the things cannot be have a like 100% test coverage, some of the things can break because of the change that some different team introduced. Now, um, so essentially what we're trying to do with introduction of microservices, we're trying to kind of like de um, de decouple things and after that we need to do, do reintegration because we broke down this monolith but still we need to have this communication of these multiple components. Now, um, there are multiple ways how you can do this, however, um, there are, oh, sorry. There are no good ways uh, to integrate microservices. The, the, we will start with some of the things that probably you've already done or you've seen some other people doing and you know that is not a very good one. The first one, it's very easy, right? You have a two components, they're running on the same machine. You can do in change between the systems um, using file system. Just one system writes in the file, another system writes in the file. Uh, not good idea, not very scalable, not, definitely not cloud native because you don't, in the cloud native environment, you don't even know like where your disk is. So file system, no. Database, how many of you spotted the uh, can of ACID? <laughs> it's a good uh, reference, right? Because we have uh, databases represented as the cans and ACID is, uh, what's the ACID? Atomacy, consistency. Isolation, durability, correct. Data loss. <laughs> Data loss. <laughs> it's a good one. All right. So you can put things in database and you can exchange information in database. Why it is bad? It is not bad. We're doing this over the years and multiple different uh, uh, teams, they interact through database. However, there are some, um, some, some things that you already know what bad about database. For example, Good thing about database, you know how to use it because it's easy. We go, go there, we can uh, find the tables, we can write the SQL queries, and we're good, good to go. We can write to tables, uh, uh, read from tables, and, and so forth and so on. Some of the system, if you have a common shared database, uh, some of the um, systems start leaking some of the data between uh, those, uh, those systems. You start breaking this, uh, the, the context, bounded context, of your system. You have a um, ordering system and you d depend on a system that interacts with some delivery services. Now, all of a sudden, you need to also understand what kind of information you need to provide so the delivery system will be successfully operate over the ordering system, so far and so on. So you need to, you cannot work on some particular thing without knowing about external world. Now, uh, databases are great unless it is just something that you own. Like you're writing your application and database this is something that you own and no one else is doing because you still need to have a persistency. Again, file system is bad because file systems don't provide you with the ways how you can recover your data if they will fail, um, so forth and so on. So we need to come up with something um, to, to use the database inside your bounded context, it's, it's totally fine. And this is the kind of uh, right way to do things. Uh, but definitely not the good thing to share the data, distribute data across multiple teams because of the things that we discussed. All right, RPC, remote procedure calls. So you're thinking, okay, so um, we were doing this, um, we were doing this, uh, the, the modules between, um, Communication between modules was simple, just calling the functions from one module and you're getting response immediately. Now, all of a sudden, when you start moving things into the microservice world, um, you still can have this ability to um, kind of, you want to have this ability to call remote code the same way as you call in your uh, local code. However, they're still not that ideal because we need to, first of all, establish um, uh, the good things. Good things first. We will not have a problems with, uh, like we have in database, kind of, sort of, because we still, uh, we're talking through the APIs. APIs well defined. Again, you being the, uh, the follower of good engineering practices, you have 
um, like versions of the API, specification is published somewhere, or maybe you would even better, you even publish the clients for different languages for this particular API. Um, like a couple years ago, there was a very good article on Netflix, how they do in APIs and how they're building their you know, services. They publish clients for different languages, different platforms that, you know, not just a raw API, but also like all these APIs were uh, uh, wrapped into um, idiomatic clients based on a particular language. And uh, when, you, uh, when you use RPC, this is something that feels natural because you're just calling another method. And you're calling this method and you're expecting a result, right? So um, despite all these kind of technicalities that go on underneath, you don't think about this, it feels natural, it's, it feels good. However, uh, there's some problems. Um, all of a sudden, uh, even if it feels like you're calling remote code the way how you call in local code, um, it still goes over the network. And uh, as we know, network, you cannot have reliable network. Like if someone tells, oh, our network is 100% reliable, this is bullshit. It's a go Google thing called 12 lies of distributed systems. You'll find that the reliable network or like our uh, system administrator is 100% available. It's another bullshit. Don't trust it. Do not trust network. Network is the one of the things that uh, fails all the time. I had a situation. I was with a client. Um, we were setting up this uh, multi uh, data center uh, system and they said, oh, we have a dedicated channel over the, um, over the ocean between our um, Atlanta data center and between our, our um, what was it, Ireland data center. And because we have dedicated wire there, our network is super fast. Um, and we're running this replication, replication goes very slow, and they send your software is shit. And I was like, no. Let's figure this out. No, 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 our network is 100% reliable. We know this, we have a wire, blah, blah, blah. Go in there, running this uh, iperf one place, iperf in another place, and I see that there's a network that's supposed to be like a few gigabits. Just give me just five megabits per second. All of a sudden, some of the network people decide to optimize it. They introduce this uh, quality of service and they cap their bandwidth. So, Network is first problem that you're trying to investigate with software. Usually, uh, software is good. Um, people might be not uh, very honest with you about things like that. So that's why uh, network is the first first problem. So now, um, once this uh, once this issue is happening between like we communicate between systems, uh, what the first thing you do um, to investigate this problem? Mm -hmm. Logs, okay. What kind of logs? Application, log. application logs. Like this one, right? Yeah, the warning, warning, warning. You look into this one and, uh, and you see, this is our guy. We cannot establish connection and things like that. So, so now think about this. What is log? So log is a sequence of events that happen in your system. There's a time, so you always know that some, some event happened. Um, severity and some additional information about the event. Um, can you change the log? Well, technically you can if you're trying to hide some, I don't know, like Russian hackers collusion. You know, I always drop in Russian jokes because I'm, I'm originally from Russia, so I think it's appropriate for me to throw <laughs> Russian hackers joke around. So I can do that. But essentially a log is immutable because this is something that you want to use as your um, source of truth, right? Because you want to know what the hell is going on with my system. Plus, I have a time here, so I can compare this time with another system and see what kind of problem they have um, on their side. So in this case, you can find this correlation, and after that, get the clear, uh, clear result. What if we will build um, our system around the concept of log, right? So in this case, we have these events that uh, we will generate there. Uh, super, uh, super cool description of event. A shared narrative that describes a business, right? So it is something that makes sense for a particular domain uh, that ex explains what is happening in the system, right? So we have uh, two types of events. One event can be notification. 
uh, for example, we're seeing these warnings events, right? It's just notification saying that something is going wrong. Another type of events is actually uh, transfer of state. So uh, Sina, uh, broad example of CDC. Every time that something is happens in the database, you're actually getting some new piece of information. The, so it's not, uh, not a notification anymore. You're actually getting some information that will affect the current state of the system. Um, so that's why there's a kind of like a two types uh, of, of this event that your application can communicate with. And uh, again, since uh, we want to have um, a representation that our system represents a real life, events are immutable. Think about this. You have a conversation with your significant other and you said something that you're not supposed to say. <laughs> you cannot take your back, uh, you cannot take your words back, right? Your words already immutable. So what you do, <laughs> you issue another event that includes apology. <laughs> this is what you do, gentlemen. Like, you always need to issue apology. You always wrong. So you send another event because you cannot change the past. Things already happened. However, it will be depend on the receiving side how fast this event would be interpreted, right? So, um, and you need to um, communicate through some system. Over the time, we developed the core abstractions for different systems. If we're talking about database, we're talking usually tables that will represent all um, small bits of um, how it's called relational algebra, right? So all these entity relations uh, will end up as a table, kind of representation of a table. Uh, once the Hadoop start uh, come into place, uh, we start talking about distributed uh, file system and all these uh, core abstractions were um, the represented by file. I, I tried to find the, uh, I tried to find the picture to represent leaky abstraction. <laughs> all right, so what kind of abstraction we have in Kafka? Log. Okay, so now we, this is how we go in, into designing system, right? We do have a log and Kafka is our log. We're going to be communicating some of the events between different systems and it's up to another system to make a reaction. So we're not building, um, actually it's one of the patterns how you build. You build orchestration or you build like a kind of um, uh, orchestration versus choreography, yeah. So essentially, like um, when you have um, orchestration, it's more like a workflow type of situation with choreography. Different systems know how to react on certain type of events. If it's notification or if it's a change of state, so far and so on. So we're going to be talking. We're going to be building. Um, we're going to building a small um, small application. Actually, there are two applications. Let me quickly show. Um, where is it? Play button. Okay. Present. Okay. We're going to be talking uh, about uh, two applications. So we're going to be using our Kafka uh, as our log where we're going to be uh, capturing certain events. And um, uh, we're going to be running two applications inside um, inside uh, uh, inside the uh, Cloud Foundry. So um, for that part of this conversation, I think uh, when, I'm not going to be talking about like a Kafka as a, for, for operators, Kafka for um, system administrators. As a developer, you know that Kafka exists. That's it. So this is what I want to know as a developer, right? I, um, I wear different hats, depends on what kind of audience uh, I'm talking. And right now I'm wearing a hat of developer and developer don't really care about how the infrastructure will be running, right? So I care about my precious code because my code is awesome. Like this is all I care about. So for me, there are a couple options. Um, a couple options what I can get usually I just need to get like a, the bootstrap server connection and after that I don't really care um, how these uh, poor operations people will support me. However, as you already learned today, there are a couple ways um, and all the ways that um, uh, you can run a complex distributed system on top of another complex distributed system and your distributed system happen to depend on another distributed system and uh, what could go wrong, right? So that's why we're running Kafka 
uh, I guess you were asking like if, if it's like makes sense to run Kafka on Kubernetes. So here's your uh, here's your counter argument when you say, hey, I'm running distributed system on top of distributed system. I don't know where my storage. There's another distributed system that depend I depend on Zookeeper, also requires storage uh, network. I don't know what is going on there. And we're saying it's fine, you know, we, we took care of it. So uh, the thing that will uh, provide you this kind of like assurance that things will work is actually human experience. Three years ago, we started building Confluent Cloud. From scratch, Kubernetes was not uh, in the uh, in where it is right now. Um, over the time, we hired people who were quite, um, quite good on supporting Kafka and their different organizations over the time um, they build, uh, they participate on the open source community, so that's why we start hiring people to build this kind of like a best, um, best experience in the cloud. An idea here is most important, is the human experience. However, uh, the cloning, the human cloning still prohibited, so we cannot just like clone people and send them uh, to different customers so they can go and uh, sit in their data centers and like tune the Kafka. Uh, in this case, it would be just like fantastic. Um, but unfortunately not, we cannot. But we can write a software that will be able to uh, do same stuff. So the experience of uh, system uh, reliability engineers, uh, system administrators of Kafka was put inside this operator. Some of the best practices that we described in the books, uh, we, I mean the company, the Confluent, we described in the books, we described this in the white papers, our blog, uh, quite popular about uh, things that are going on in Kafka world. Not just to write about this in the blog or in the book, but just take this and automate this and make this as a part of um, a software package. So this is how uh, Operator was born for our necessity to build uh, cloud and uh, provide this automated uh, best practices. Now we want to provide the same uh, experience for operations teams around the world. So since um, everyone is going to, to Kubernetes somehow, regardless if Kubernetes goes to your organization or you're going out from your organization going to another organization where there's Kubernetes, you one way or another, you will get Kubernetes in like next six, 12 months. Um, it is something that is going on. Or maybe it's just confirmation bias that like I develop because I'm talking about Kubernetes all the time. Um, so uh, I promised not to talk about Kafka on Kubernetes and now I'm talking about Kafka on Kubernetes. Now, um, let me quickly switch to one, um, one slide I want to show. Yeah, I uh, wanted to show this slide. Yeah, I missed that. Um, the way how it works. Um, when the Java was announced 25 years ago, almost, uh, the promise was run once, uh, write once, run everywhere. Um, not precisely right. However, I think the, the containers actually brought us to the point where we can like package our apps uh, once and we can run this everywhere. We can run this on the standalone, we can just run this uh, in Docker, or if you're running a complex distributed system, we need to have some sort of orchestrator. So in this particular case, we're running this in, in whatever, Kubernetes, Mesos, uh, or whatnot. Kubernetes already won. Everyone is supporting uh, the Kubernetes, so let's focus on the solving the problem in, inside the Kubernetes. So we, um, we actually started the partnering with Pivotal for, for quite some time, like even before we were um, uh, working on productizing the operator. Uh, we work on providing the um, kind of like a packaged version of our platform in the form of uh, Helm charts. How many of you heard about Helm? For those of you who don't know, uh, Helm, it's just a, uh, it's a tool um, that uh, generates one YAML from templated YAML. That's it. Nothing more. It's not a, it's not a software that, uh, you know, we distribute on or whatnot. It's just a templating engine that allows us to customize certain things. Uh, and YAML, well, um, well, so it's, it is kind of sort of declarative language and the, the people embrace it to use, uh, to describe a uh, state of the world that they want to be. But as always with some of the good intentions, bad intentions come, people start over, overusing things. Some, sometimes I see YAML, there's a bunch of shell scripts just integrated in, into, into YAML, it's just terrible because you're mixing, again, leaking abstraction, you're making, uh, mixing things um, declarative and um, 
in the what was the opposite to declarative? Imperative. Imperative, exactly. Approach where you have this like shell scripts that doing things for you. Um, it can go well for certain times. Definitely, you can install with the Helm charts. Uh, what next? The next, we need to have this knowledge to run, keep this running. So uh, we were working on uh, Pivotal um, uh, PKS, and we certified on, on PKS uh, to run our operator. And also, uh, it's also certified in the major cloud platform. So um, you don't need to think about this, because Kubernetes is kind of sort of standard, but still it's kind of like a Linux 15 years ago. Everyone building their own distribution, everyone building their own UI. Um, we, uh, we like when there is a uh, big organization supports uh, this kind of thing that comes not only with installation, but also day two uh, responsibilities like security, like uh, um, uh, the, the monitoring and all sorts of observability and things like that. This is why we're working with this uh, with PKS. So now, this is uh, enough of the slides. Uh, because I'm just tired standing already. Um, so um, what we're going to be doing? I do have uh, my, uh, let me do this full screen, like a real programmers. OK, so essentially, uh, Rocket API. So uh, before that, I said, yeah, I'm going to my directory, and I'll do Kafka uh, broker API version. So essentially, this is a, this is a Kafka cluster that deployed on PKS uh, using operator, and also uh, we do have a domain name register for this one. So if I will run this command that essentially takes a bootstrap server and interrogates um, the endpoint, so I'll get correct metadata. This is like simplest way how we can check connectivity to your, uh, to your Kafka cluster, not just the telnet, but actually getting uh, to talk to this Kafka cluster through, um, through protocol that um, this tool understands. And um, all the things that I should see, uh, I'll get not only bootstrap server, but also I get the brokers um, that uh, create these clusters. In this case, B0, B1, and B2. So I have a three, 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 um, three brokers here. So it's up and running, it's good. And this is where I want to forget about where to run Kafka, okay? So next thing. Um, How many of you know the, the place, like first place where developer wants to be in their lives? <laughs> no, it's production. <laughs> developers wants to be, developers want to be in production. Because it's cool, because in production, like every, all great things happen in production. Like <laughs> you deploy, you deploy on Friday, right? Yeah. So good things happen on Friday. Always, like you deploy in production and you, you're good to go. And especially when you deploy in every day, deploying on Friday just becomes your, you know, another day of deployment. So you don't really care. Um, but the second place is start.spring.io. <laughs> so essentially, start.spring.io, like when you are uh, in despair, <laughs> you always need to go there and you can find some, some of the cool things. Uh, why you can find some of the cool things? Because, um, it has Kafka. So Spring Framework um, includes a lot of opinionated components that allows you to, uh, to interact with different, uh, different systems. And Kafka is not, uh, not, uh, not exception here, right? So there is a project called Spring-Kafka, which is a foundational uh, wrapper library around uh, the low-level producer-consumer Kafka API, which is Java library. Um, Spring Kafka makes it more springy, so that's why there's some opinionated about, opinions about configurations. Um, there are uh, certain things that will align with overall uh, the paradigm of uh, Spring. So as a matter of fact, here you can just like uh, go and type with me together. Uh, if you uh, will, will forget what I'm typing, so everything that I will be talking about here in this, um, um, 
in this playbook uh, that will uh, you know, require things that you, what you need to type, what you need to enter, and the so far so good. But this part is easy. So we go in Spring for Kafka. Next thing we do, uh, again, Kafka. Spring for Kafka stream. So one of the uh, examples that we're going to be doing is two applications. One application is a web service that um, you know you can uh, provide this your your API service where your UI can talk to, your mobile version can talk to, and uh, after that, uh, once you get this information, you need to start do some processing. So we'll have a one application that will include UI, so in this particular case, it's going to be REST API. And another application will be just like a daemon that's sitting there, listens all this command and do some processing. So we're going to be using Kafka Streams for, for second version of application. So we're going to be using Spring Cloud, um, Cloud Streams, uh, Spring, let's do, Kafka always works, uh, we just I need type three time Kafka and I'll get all the libraries that are available. So, so Spring Cloud Stream, um, it is a um, higher level abstraction that was built on idea that was created by Spring Integration. How many heard about Spring Integration? Naming is hard, right? So when you're talking about Spring Kafka Integration or you're trying to Google Spring Kafka Integration, will it show you Spring Kafka or it will show you Spring Integration Kafka? So. Uh, so this is why, like, uh, look for uh, Spring Cloud Streams, which essentially provides like a more high-level thing. So you are um, in your code, you're writing kind of like a cell style of your like uh, like uh, uh, things that will be getting messages, uh, doing something with the messages, and sending messages somewhere. And after that, underlying framework will do the wiring. It will be providing your underlying. Um, bindings to transports, so Spring Cloud Stream support Rabbit, it support Kafka, and uh, from application code, if you're not doing like a very low level integration, say you're not using like a Kafka Streams, um, because you cannot use Kafka Streams of Rabbit, but if you will be following some of the APIs, you can even have um, kind of like migration pattern between uh, multiple systems. Since I mentioned, since I mentioned this uh, uh, system, we're going to be using some of the REST endpoint. I will use Spring Web. Also, uh, I like to write uh, effective code, so I will write a bunch of annotation. After that, it will be generated. Um, so this is why I'm using Lombok here. And if I forgot to include something, I can always look to here: Spring Kafka, Spring Kafka Streams, Cloud Streams, Lombok. Okay. Um, I'm going to Spring Initializer. Uh, I'll go in io.confluence developer. Um, you know the cool thing? That if you will get this one, like this guy, and turn this to vice versa, um, you will get third place that every developer wants to be. And it's called uh, developer.confluent.io. You know, when you generated your uh, Spring Boot applications, this is where you want to land to start learning things about Kafka. Um, this is something that you can take, you know, take home, do uh, do your own thing, and after that, uh, you know, learn stuff. But I'll just like show this uh, to you that you can also explore this after. Um, and what my uh, what my thing said, developer in Kafka Kafka workshop. Okay. We're going to be using Kafka Workshop as our artifact. Uh, we're going to be using Maven. It's OK. Um, Java. Today, we're going to be using Java. And I think that would be it. So I'm doing this. And uh, uh, downloads, unzip uh, Kafka Workshop, Kafka Workshop, oh, oh, CD. OK, um, so what the first command we should run here? Oh, I waited for No. Maven verify. Um, run this verify. There's something, first of all, verify you need to type less. And verify does the same thing. Um, and build, there's no command in Maven build. There's either install or package. So, uh, But install, you don't want to install this in your uh, the Maven repository. So yeah, verify. Something that you will be learning today, um, we're skipping the tests because it's not the test workshop. Speaking about which. Um, how many of you heard about Kafka Summit? 
Kafka Summit is the event that uh, we um, kind of sort of organizing, but we're trying to bring communities. So this is why like uh, some people asking, oh, you can't phone, you're bringing your competitors to Kafka Summit. Yeah, because it's community. We want to have a vibrant community and we want to people to decide themselves. Like if they like our stuff or they like a stuff from, I don't know, from, from some other competitor. So this is why we're organizing this one, community event, super cool. And the reason why I'm talking about this, um, and um, let me see. Uh, Oh, this guy, you probably heard about him. Uh, 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 doesn't work. Okay, let's see if I can do agenda. Let me see, maybe there's a, a link from agenda. Uh, and I'll do, okay, okay, let's see, learn more. And I'm gonna be talking about testing. You know, how not to test your Kafka streams, you know, how to test your uh, stuff in production, but actually writing your integration test, your um, um, unit test, all sorts of tests, but this is in, in April. But today, we're gonna be doing skip tests. Um, just because it's uh, the faster and I just don't need to do this kind of uh, things. All right, so we just make sure that we will get all the dependencies. Now, the next thing is that it's actually fairly easy because you need to go and uh, copy paste this uh, stuff um, uh, from, uh, from this uh, workbook, um, from the um, playbook. A couple things here. So I mentioned in the very beginning that one of the things that we develop at Confluent is a set additional tools. Specifically, uh, Scheme Registry is the hub of information where different microservices can kind of like discover what's the format of the data. So the hardest thing in the world of like data integration is figure out what kind of data in what format it is. And uh, the Avro is was like one of the, it still is, uh, one of the f uh, standards in Hadoop world uh, because it has certain uh, distinct qualities specifically. Um, with Avro, when you're designing your objects in Avro, you can have ability to um, to specify certain fields as a backward compatible, forward compatible, full compatible, so you have a clear path to scheme evolution. Another thing that um, Avro has uh, is a framework. It has uh, two different um, uh, schemas for reading and writing. So even though your application might be using a new version of schema, it still will be able to read data uh, that was created by uh, 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 application that has an old version of schema. Because a read schema and write schema in Avro is a two separate things. So it, it, it simplifies the ways how we can perform say, oh, I'm doing a great of my system, but um, one team said, uh, another team said, oh, I will cannot do because it's, it, uh, it's not in our like, schedule or whatnot. Don't despair, because with Avro, you will be able to define compatibility. So in this case, if they will be using new format, your application will be break because you're just reading data that only relevant to your old version. So we're gonna be using the scam registry stuff. Um, and uh, some additional things to, um, to, to add uh, for um, Kafka Streams. So Kafka Streams, the Java library, it needs to understand how to uh, serialize and deserialize objects. So we're also providing uh, libraries that do uh, this stuff. Um, let me open this um, tool called IntelliJ IDEA. How many of you are using IntelliJ IDEA? Oh, it's awesome ID for developing microservices. <laughs> uh, how many of you are using Eclipse? Uh, NetBeans? STS? It's also ID, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, okay, so, um, no, I'm just kidding. Like, uh, if it, it's just like up to, if it makes you uh, performant and uh, you still productive, it's, it's totally fine. Um, I'm very productive with IntelliJ and uh, uh, for my demos, I'm gonna be using um, IntelliJ here. All right, so uh, where I need to put my dependencies after rest of the dependencies here. Um, the next thing, uh, before I'm doing the refresh, I need to add the repository uh, that, um, that have all these um, dependencies. So we put this somewhere here, repositories. Um, I can use I will show you control center. So I will also include this uh, monitoring interceptors. I will show you control center. Um, and I will put this into 
dependency. Now I can go and do import changes. And if it will not break, uh oh. Yay, dependencies. Extra one, good one. Uh, copy pasting um, and approving code completion. This is what I called software engineering in 2020. Um, now, so another thing. Uh, I mentioned that we're going to be using Avro, and I want to show you like quick trick that allows you to. Um, how many of you get paid for lines of code you wrote? <laughs> if you were, I will show you a cool trick, or you can negotiate in the future. Like you can say, "Hey, um, can I get paid for lines of code I wrote?" Um, um, in this case, I will do this one. So. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Um, so where are these plugins? Plugin, plugin. Uh, we're putting this plugin, plugins, extra, extra formatting. Uh, do import. I'll do. Uh, man, uh, call it Avro. So. Um, In my, what's the name of this file? We call it what? User? What? Uh, user, yep. Um, call it file, new file, user avvsc, avro schema. So this is how we define a, our like domain. So we're going to be, uh, capturing some of the user data and we will process if the user has some of the age restrictions we will be doing some filtering on this one so um, the idea of um, of avro is that like we as a multiple teams we communicate through this kind of like intermediate uh, thing that allows us abstract from um, actual implementation and after that everyone can go and uh, generate their own artifacts for their language because there's a um, you can use Avro in Java, you can use Avro in .NET, you can use Avro in Go um, and you can have it like one way how you can define your schema and um, remember what I said, uh, Maven uh, verify skip test, i show you something. So. Once it's done, we do Maven uh, refresh, and if we go in here, uh, 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 we're getting just generated sources, and we got this user guy. So, and this is where I told you that, like, if you get, uh, if you want to get paid for lines of code that you get, check this out. So. We get this class that looks like a poetry, but not entirely, because it class it is more like a smart class that also includes information about how to serialize itself. So in this case, framework uh, that will be, you know, we're going to be using will be invoking certain methods. Uh, specifically, it also includes information about schema. It also includes, uh, where is it, like, uh, like a binary representation of the object. Another cool, cool, cool thing about Avro is Avro is much smaller than Java serialization. So first thing is cross-platform. You can use this in the different languages and you can communicate through this multiple, um, uh, multiple languages, multiple frameworks. Um, and the second thing is that uh, your payload it would be smaller. Schema registry will hold actual schema, but Kafka, in Kafka you will be storing only actual bytes. So you don't need to send the schema with every payload. So your size, this is kind of like switching to the binary formats, not necessarily Avro. There's a plenty of different formats. Avro is like supported by frameworks uh, that like natively. Uh, we're working on supporting some other frameworks like uh, protobuf schema and uh, like a JSON schema. Uh, in the next release, we're gonna be doing this one. For now, Avro um, is also like getting a pretty nice result. So if you want, you look into ways how we can reduce the consumption of the data that uh, um, your Kafka already storing, uh, you can switch to binary formats. Um, so yeah, we're gonna be using this one. So uh, first thing I wanna show you um, is how you can, uh, this is my Spring Boot Avro application. Let's start with very simple um, Kafka workshop. We'll only copy things that we need here. And the rest of the stuff we don't need. 
Um, so Spring Boot provides certain uh, ways how application needs to be um, configured, certain ways how uh, you interact with these frameworks. Import class, uh, import class. Uh, here's a hidden, um, hidden Easter egg for you. Uh, bean, right? And we're in Chicago. Uh, and my presentation has picture of bean. <laughs> Here's a here's a deep uh, deep uh, deep reference. Anyway, so the bean is actually uh, the way how the Spring Boot will find this uh, this component and instantiate. So a couple things here. Um, we're gonna be using um, these uh, Spring provided the ways how we can inject certain configurations. So in our uh, we don't need to have any hard codings in 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 our code. So let's do something with. Um, First, uh, let's do uh, how we can get new, how we can get here, new, come on, new Java class. And we're going into, into what? Uh, let's, let's start with producer. Uh, we'll call it producer. And our producer will actually encapsulate certain uh, things here. So first of all, it is a um, Spring service. Uh, like I said, copy pasting and approving code completion. A um, couple things. So, if you ever uh, work with uh, Spring and uh, working on integration on uh, some systems starting from uh, GDBC, MyBodies, uh, maybe JMS, you probably heard about the concept of um, of template and. Uh, it would be not surprise for you uh, to hear that there is also a Kafka template that allows you to um, communicate with external system the way how the Spring like to communicate with it. So essentially, Kafka template is very thin wrapper around like the producer API. If you go here, there's a bunch of methods uh, that uh, where is my um, structure uh, things like uh, send. Uh, methods that producer has to send some data, um, but also like you can get um, some of the asynchronous versions of this uh, of this call. And again, this is also opinionated because now you're operating within uh, framework. Uh, but actually, it's a good thing. One of the good thing is that also it provides us some sort of certain like sane defaults. So I don't need to go uh, um, and be crazy like configuring every possible parameter. For example, if I will run this like this, I probably will fail because I'm using Avro. I need to change serialization. But if you need to just produce string, string, to Kafka that runs locally, um, you can just leave code like this. By default, it will be using local host, um, and uh, will be you will be able to produce. Now, uh, since we start talking about local host and things like that, so how you would run Kafka in general, right? Any ideas? Like when you develop in Kafka applications, what you usually do? Oh, interesting. I haven't heard this one. What kind of Docker? Uh, images. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe this one. Maybe this one. For Kafka, uh, where's SRC? Uh, where's it? Debian. And I see, oh, a bunch of stuff here. And there's a secret here. You're probably using this and you don't know, or using some, 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 some. Handmade, uh, handmade Docker image. There are no official <laughs> Apache Kafka. So if you if you go to Apache Kafka, uh, Kafka .apache .org, there's no uh, official Docker images. People are kind of either rolling their own or using Confluence one. So sorry, it's not a shameless plug. It's just a plug that like I know it's a fact. Um, the and also like our demos that we like distribute. If you go to CP demo, which is um, which is our like demo platform. It's like end to end has all the components starts immediately. Also use Docker and um, Docker compose all stuff. It's configured security. Super cool thing. Anyway, anyone else using things less uh, like others than Docker? Uh, okay, Ladin. <laughs> um, 
here's the thing. Uh, we have this um, command called Confluent that allows me to run some of the and manage my local environment. Uh, for example, I can do start that will start all components of Confluent platform. And the cool thing about this, it also knows order how to start this. And uh, if I um, don't know like that I need to start Zookeeper first or where Zookeeper even is, um, I'm just using this uh, just for local development. Starts all the components. Scheme registry depends on Kafka, um, and it will be using Kafka as a storage. Uh, there's a Kafka REST, Kafka Connect. I will leave this um, running. The, while it's running, we will uh, switch to some of the um, some of the configurations. Now, consumer. Um, in the, in the world of Kafka. There are two components, producer and consumer. Um, the producer writes data, consumer reads data. In the world of Spring, uh, there's message listener. Over the time, like back in the day, Spring developed this like a, a thin um, uh, replacement of uh, event-driven beans, right? Or no, not event-driven, message-driven beans. Um, and over the time, the concept of this kind of like uh, the listener or some sort of like a message listener um, evolved and uh, if you were looking to Rabbit integration, if you were looking to GMS integration and even Kafka integration, you will have a, some sort of a listener thing here. So in this particular case, uh, and I will have a Kafka listener, I have a my method that will be uh, my message listener and uh, Spring Framework will instantiate um, Kafka consumer that will be reading data from, from the topic and just simply prints this out uh, over here. Um, also here I'm using this like weird uh, SPL um, that allows me to read this topic information from, uh, from configuration and inject here so I don't need to have any, um, uh, how it's called, uh, hard coding, right? Now, um, and uh, the third thing is that we need to have a, um, uh, uh, our controller, like the uh, Java class REST. Um, it, it's very straightforward. We just need to um, inject our uh, producer here. Um, and uh, I'm using here um, constructor injection, so this is why I'm using Lombok to generate the uh, required arguments constructor. Since I have my producer as a final here, uh, it requires uh, requires to be instantiated in um, in constructor, so it will be injecting here. Next thing, um, I also want to create a method that will be listening certain um, certain endpoint. What is that? Uh, what? Kafka control, not a REST controller, okay. Um, Where's it rename? Uh, so let me rename the name file. Yeah, that will be better. So, typically, uh, it's very difficult to to expose something to to outside world, saying, "Hey, um, since today we're going to be doing uh, Avro or, or everywhere, um, all your web frameworks need to support Avro." It would be kind of a very bold move to do. So this is why, uh, in order to build uh, the way how the JavaScript people building their UIs, they they like JSON. Uh, we're exposing them um, JSON point, and Spring already handles for us. Um, the way how we can handle this API calls, right? So in this case, we hide all these like low level things in terms of like integration of the services. We're exposing REST endpoint, we're exposing JSON payload, and after that, we read this message and the transform it into the format that all our like services will be using. So in this particular case, we will send some of the uh, curl message, and after that, this message would be published in Avro format. And uh, 
last but not least, uh, I mentioned Avro today. This is why we're not going to be using application properties. We're going to be using application, oops, file. We're going to be using application.yaml. Um, this is what you usually do with YAML, also copy pasting and make sure that formatting is, um, is on point because otherwise it would be very difficult to find problem. Okay, let's take a look on the configuration. So um, Springs, uh, Spring also provides a, uh, the ways how you can define this configuration and you separate your configuration from your application code. Um, this is very important because going forward, we're not gonna be changing the code, we just will be changing configuration, going to the next environment. So we're starting locally. The next thing, we're gonna be going to our, cl our Cloud Foundry um, as our the, the place where we're gonna um, run this in production, right? So, couple of things. Uh, bootstrap servers, this is where uh, we need to connect to Kafka. This is our clients will connect to Kafka. Schema registry URL. Uh, schema registry is a uh, REST, um, REST service. So you need to um, connect there uh, through, through REST or all this, uh, for example, this guy, Kafka Avro Deserializer and uh, Kafka Avro Serializer will be handled this for you. So in your code, uh, you don't need to do anything. As you can see here uh, in producer, uh, only thing that you're specifying is what type of class of this uh, uh, the factory would be created, um, the template will be created. Um, so underlying system, including Spring and including uh, uh, Kafka framework will be allowed to use this like a configuration and inject correct serializer, deserializer, so you don't need to pollute your code and uh, do this kind of uh, manual thing. So this is pretty much it. So this is what we do for, um, for our uh, local stuff. So um, where you can get this um, confluent command? Uh, in, my, in my document over here, I do have uh, prerequisites. If you go to this uh, prerequisites, you'll have a link how we can install Confluent CLI and how we can install Confluent Platform. Again, not necessarily you're doing this right now, but it's good if you're doing this, uh, you you know, learning and you will um, not fall asleep after this awesome uh, uh, lunch. But like if something will not uh, go wrong, I'm, I might be going too fast. Um, for that matter, I have my contacts over there. So if you have so many questions after, you can definitely hit me up afterwards. Also, if you did the pictures of my slides, you, you might find on the bin, I do have my Twitter handle. Uh, also strategically placed on every slide. Again, most important uh, most important slide for this presentation. Was there a Kafka tattoo as well? Oh yes, it was Kafka tattoo. Uh, it, sometimes it appears, sometimes it disappears. So <laughs> it's, uh, it depends on the time of the year. So right now it's too too cold for, for Kafka tattoo. All right, so let's run this application. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Maybe it can be permanent. Depends on uh, how good we will be uh, performing over the, uh, over the years. So. Maybe, uh, never say never. It looks very nice, eh? So this why I'm. Uh, so um, I'm running this uh, application now. I, I would see bunch of stuff uh, would be placed here. One of the things that I would see here, admin client. So there are actually three types of like native APIs that are available for you as a Java developer. It's a producer API, it's a consumer API, and cl uh, um, um, admin client API. So essentially, all things that you can do through this uh, standard tools, they're actually calling the um, certain APIs. Like if you're using the Kafka console consumer, underneath it's still running the Kafka consumer uh, APIs. If you're creating topics, reading topics, and all this sort of information, underneath it's calling admin API. So cool thing is that uh, this uh, thing is is very nicely uh, integrated into, um, into Spring, so thanks to Spring Kafka uh, framework. So in this case, once we define this class, you see this, uh, this, is, this is a new topic uh, class that comes from, uh, from the Kafka admin API uh, package. And uh, Spring Boot would be smart enough 
to instantiate uh, uh, our admin client and create all these topics. And being a good engineer and providing good engineering practices, you need to define your own topics and you need to specify what kind of topic topology you need to be using because uh, this is your responsibility uh, for your application. Same way as, as it was your responsibility to define schema for your databases, um, uh, defining the topic topology, uh, because you know exactly what you're using in terms of like how many consumers, because based on the numbers of partitions, you might define your, um, how, how can, you can scale your consumers, how many consumers can run in parallel within uh, consumer groups so far and so on. So, uh, once uh, Spring Boot will find this uh, bin, it will instantiate this new topic. And how I can see this? Since I am running this full platform, I do have a control center deployed uh, locally. And for development purposes, control center is free. So you can use this uh, without any restrictions well, as long as you're developing with this. By default, it creates this uh, local uh, users topics uh, that I defined in my My application YAML. Na name of topic, uh, number of partitions, and uh, what's the replication factor. Uh, so this thing will change whilst we will go into uh, to different uh, to different environments. Now, um, so we need to run a very sophisticated um, UI here. Uh, it's called curl. So essentially, this is our uh, the web endpoint where we're running user publish. This is my payload. Um, this is, yeah, still 34, it's good to go. Um, now, so what we can see here, we will see that our consume, uh, we consume this message and how we can find this because voila, we have log, right? All the things that we can see here are in log. Um, also, we can go here and watch the messages that land into, uh, into this topic. Let me do it bigger. So I'll try to do this. No messages. How come? So um, Kafka remembers. We just go in here and uh, we're setting offset from particular partition. Um, and also it will not show me anything because I know exactly what kind of partition it will use. Partition number one because I use key as my name. So I know that my name, once I apply hash function, will give me partition number, number one. Good question. So how you can specify partition key? So essentially, once we have a producer, once we have our um, Kafka template that will be published data into, um, into Kafka topic, uh, we have two things here, key and value. Uh -huh. Key, uh, it is uh, something that will be responsible for uh, Part placement the particular partition. So in this particular case, once I specify in this key uh, like this, see, I put this uh, name as my key and uh, my uh, like full blown user as a as my as my value. So in this case, yes, I know that if I'll do something different, uh, Sina, how old are you? Uh, Thirty-three. All right, so let's see where uh, we have. So also, Sina end up in the same in the same partition. So good to go. Um, so this is how I can say if I will do I don't know like uh, I don't know drawn and value fifty five. Uh, probably it will end up on a different partition. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Because I, my next application actually does age discrimination. <laughs> this one is just only capturing data. Um, you see, so it, it lands on a different partition because based on the key hash function, uh, decide to place it here. Uh, so that's why it's also like if I, every time will I will be sending information about the John, say John got a little bit older, 
it also will land on the same partition. So this is how you can get this kind of like ordering of the same key. Same you're doing like typical example, credit card transactions, all if you're using credit card key, credit card number as your key, all transactions will land on the same partition. So you can process them in order how these messages arrive. So it's some, some of the cool feature of the Kafka. All right, so this is Spring Boot part. Now, next thing is that we're going into the world of um, uh, Spring Cloud Stream. So to, to the point of age discrimination. Um, I do have, um, uh, where's my Spring Cloud Streams. All right, um, in order to me to pr proceed, I need to create new, uh, new, let me just uh, stop it here. I'll call it, call it Avro uh, package. Uh, yes. I can type in the talk, but okay. since you insist, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I have like just a basic question. Yes, on please. The, on the uh, code itself, uh -huh. like in the producer, some, sometimes we use uh, producer.spin, sometimes we use Kafka template.spin. What is the difference? Between? Why are you doing this? I don't know. Like, if you're using if you're using Kafka templates, stick to Kafka template. Do not create uh, like multiple code things and the same. Like, they doing the same thing, but in this case, your code becoming weird, like in a bad way because um, you're not following like you're not fully embracing framework. But like, why are you using framework then? So framework will do like certain things for you. Yeah, maybe. But like, why? It's still not very good justification, right? If you're using framework, s try to stick to like things that uh, the framework provides you because, in general, uh, people writing code much less than people reading code. So if your coworker was trying to figure out uh, why you have a producer dot sent and why you have Kafka template, he will have the same questions. He will find maybe I'm dumb, maybe I'm don't understand something about this. And after that, instead of just focusing on the solving problem, he will try to question himself, his life choices, and things like that, right? So you don't want to be the, um, the person that creates this kind of friction. You want to like, follow good practices. Spring Kafka provides good practices. Like if you're embracing the framework, use framework, follow their rules. In this case, it would be much easier to transition this code or trans transport this code to other person. So person who knows framework will catch up very quickly. Or if you're not using framework, you can stick to the standard uh, producer consumer. I'm not saying it's just a matter of uh, taste, but it's rather a matter of uh, like matter of good engineering practices and communication within the team. It's just uh, you know you're mixing multiple things, like using knife to cut onions and cut mangoes. So the smell of onions will end up on your mangoes. It will be weird, right? The same thing here, essentially. <laughs> Um, I don't know if I answered this question. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, let's do a new package. Uh, we do Avro Spring Cloud Streams. Um, so next, um, this is where we're going into the world of uh, stream processing. So why you need to do this? What's your stream processing? So essentially you have this uh, system that can uh, do this pops up. This is how the Kafka usually land on your organization. Hey, we need to have a better pops up system. Hey, let's let's do Kafka. Um, and over the time, you start thinking, okay, so this this like a consumer thing that okay, we read the message, we need to do something with this message, and after that, we're either writing back to Kafka or writing some another system. And this is where you have this kind of like a fork where where you want to go. So you definitely don't want to go into the route where actually it's, there's a, like a three way fork. Um, you don't want to go to the route where you need to write everything from scratch because, again, there is a framework for that. So if you're doing this, okay, I'm writing my own stream processing framework, good luck with that, if you get paid for writing stream processing framework. It's also, you know, noble job, not much, but honest job. Second thing, that you in the route to writing some of the logic. So in this case, you're using framework like Kafka Streams that allows you to focus on processing, and I will show it in a couple seconds. And the third thing, if you need to do integration with third-party system, again, you're not in the business to write integration framework, you need to use things like Kafka Connect. Kafka Connect is a, um, it's a runtime 
that allows you to write multiple, uh, multiple different uh, connectors. What is a connector? Connector is just like small archive that includes some jars and some dependencies, and Kafka Connect will be responsible for running those connectors, providing lifestyle to stop connector, to, to stop connector, to configure connector, to scale out the connect if you need to do like a faster consumption and faster production. So Kafka Connect allows you to connect, uh, connect virtually any source. Just name whatever system you need to integrate and we'll see if we have a connector for that. Anyone? Yes. Sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. <laughs> yes. Logic. Okay, so we're doing this. Mark logic, Kafka. I'm pretty sure there is one because um, it's. Um, I'm pretty sure there is one. There is a connector for that, but this connector not in the uh, Confluent Hub. So there is a connector for Mark logic that allows you to do that. Um, anything else? A any other source? Or Cassandra? It's too easy <laughs> because there's like two. So two types of connectors. Um, there's a connector uh, that allows you to bring data in. This is what we call uh, source connector. So you can have a source system that you need to constantly reading data from the source system and bring data to Kafka. So in this particular case, what is that? Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, connecting with the best practices is sync connector. So the sync connector, it's a different one. So you already have something in your Kafka and you not need to lend this into uh, the Cassandra. So this is where you have this uh, connector that listens things that happen in Kafka and constantly pumping this into, into, um, into Cassandra. Um, let's do another one. There was another Cassandra. Uh, there was uh, one from Confluent that includes uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, I don't see it. Uh, doo -doo 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 scene connector. It's another scene connector. Why we don't have a source connector? Let's see if we have any, like a CDC for Cassandra. Maybe Debezium has it, something. So Debezium is the, um, it's a framework to develop uh, Kafka Connect uh, connectors, but uh, those connectors are specialized on uh, change data capture. So you, you, they natively integrate with databases. Uh, in their ways how you can listen their transaction log or write ahead log or whatever uh, mechanism or capturing changes they have. Um, the Debezium uh, exists like for say MySQL, Postgres, SQL. So there are a lot of connectors. If they are not in Confluent Hub, you just go and Google and say uh, Cassandra source connector Kafka. And uh, Kafka Connect connector. So um, write the connector, Cassandra can produce a source and sync connector. So someone wrote this connector that actually can do uh, source and sync. So it can read data from Cassandra and write data to Cassandra. So there you go. Now, where, where I was. So essentially, like every time when you think that from your application you need to do two things, you're probably doing something wrong. So um, a framework like Kafka Streams is exists to integrate only with Kafka, uh, not because you cannot integrate. You can do because it's just a code. You can do whatever you want, uh, and I'm not, not the person to tell you not to. Um, again, we adults here, you can evaluate your life choices by yourself. However, the all the things around like exactly one processing and the way how this uh, framework works with Kafka. Uh, is designed around this framework working with Kafka. It doesn't, so if you do stream processing and after that you need to write to some distributed, uh, I don't know, like uh, some REST service or some database or somewhere else, start thinking why you're doing this. Um, think about Kafka and all the stream processing things as kind of like Unix pipes and all the small utilities that you're passing through. So you have a cat from the file, you piping to grep, and again the piping to TR. So in this particular case, your pipes are Kafka, and all these small tools is your Kafka streams or your um, or your consumer producer application. So if you need to do, say, um, write to some external system to another file, 
uh, you're using connector for that. So every time we're using pipe, it's a Kafka. Every time when you're specifying the input output of system out, uh, system input and system out, this is your Kafka connect. Everything in between is your Kafka streams or any other framework. For example, you can also write stream processing applications using Spark. But anyway, we're going to be focusing on Kafka streams now. Uh, let's, uh, let's go here and um, see what do we have here now. Uh, Kafka streams apps. Um, choo -choo -choo -choo. Yes. Yes, uh, there's a replicator for that. Yeah. Confluent replicator does exactly what you're asking. Uh, okay, so. Uh, okay, we're creating, um, we're creating this one. Enable bindings, import. Uh, uh, where is, ah, bindings. There's, there's no binding because binding, there's something that I need to create myself. So um, in the code, I'm defining this, uh, the binding that will be um, specified my input and output for my like application topology. So in this particular case, I will be using two, two, um, two, uh, two topics. One topic will include data, um, uh, insert data that will be produced by my application. Another uh, will be creating topic that we're going to be using to discriminate older people. So uh, let me see here. And again, this application will not going to discriminate this. It only provides the data for further uh, system because you can build the pipeline. So one system can produce data, another system can do some of the massaging of the data, filtering data, transforming the data, and the third system will start doing this stuff that um, supposed to be okay oh what I'm doing it's a spring boot application it's a standard we're good um, we we'll also be using our topics information that we will use I also copy pasted from uh, my application uh, and I'm going here, uh, topic parameters. Uh, okay, we're good here. Now, um, so Spring Cloud Streams allows us to define how the data will come into our application code. And after that, we'll be using configuration to specify binder, which will be um, actually adapter to the system that will be a transport of our data. In this particular case, we're gonna be using um, Kafka binder. And the most important thing here is what we're going to be doing with this data. Uh, standard uh, component annotation, import class, import class. And we're sending this to, okay. And we're doing this one, users. And that's it. Okay, so let's take a look on this code. So this is our piece of logic that we want to perform on this topic data. Sorry, OCD is is very why it's not why it's not there. It should be there. There's log information somewhere lost. But anyway, it should be there. So. Um, we're using this special annotation from Spring Cloud Streams called the Streams Listener. So essentially for every message that happens in input topic, this particular case, um, the Spring Cloud Streams will inject our uh, instance of this case stream thing. So uh, I've seen the touch this little bit. Um, case stream is essentially the abstraction that built on top Kafka topic that provides you the way to how you can um, talk to this topic more like you're talking to the stream rather than you talking to Kafka topic. It's just abstraction. Same way as you have, um, say, Java Util streams, right? Um, you can talk to your collection through just iterating over collection, but more functional approach, like a functional programming type of approach, is that you creating stream from this collection, which essentially your kind of view on this collection, and you can go and read these uh, messages 
from this collection. Same thing you can do this with uh, Kafka streams. It creates this abstraction that allows you to uh, operate over the data that stores in your Kafka topic. So in this case, this thing would be injected by frameworks. Now, once it's injected here, I can perform all type of things that are available for me in, um, in this framework. So in this particular case, um, Again, if you ever use Java Util streams, you uh, feel lots of similarities here. In this particular case, I want to filter. So in this case, I am providing this predicate saying, hey, um, for anyone who, I want to listen all the messages where the age more than 40, uh, less than 40. Okay, so it's a, it's a discrimination of the like, younger people, uh, like millennials and uh, the other stuff. So um, next thing that I also want to do some, some logic here. I, I actually lied when I said I'm not going to be doing anything. So in this particular case, I'm changing the like, name in the different case, right? So for this particular case, I'm using this function called map values. I can also use function map that allows me to transform and uh, key and value as well. Um, so it, uh, it gets uh, the map value gets me a what? A value mapper, which is, looks like what? Like function, essentially, it's a function that gets a, a, um, a value and gets some result out. Actually, it's interesting. So it's not using this uh, standard Java frameworks uh, framework um, like functions, uh, like a, like a functional interfaces. And the reason for that, um, the Kafka stream was doing this even before it was officially supported in Java. 8. So you could, you, you could in the past, you could use uh, um, prior. Kafka streams or Kafka 2, you can use it even from with Java 6. So that's why all these interfaces need to be created. But uh, since compiler is smart enough, it can interpret this and infer this as a, um, as a function because it just uh, checks like what's the input parameter, what's the output parameter. So another thing is that we also can do uh, some, some intermediate, so in, uh, intermediate operations. So in this particular case, my peak method allows me to kind of like a, uh, look inside of the stream. So everything is going there, and I'm creating small thing, and I'm looking to what's going on in the stream. So in this particular case, this peak allowed me to kind of sort of debugging this information and uh, put this into log. Um, that's it. And after that, um, we, we have this thing called send to. Um, Essentially, there is API. Let me show you. Um, just create a variable for uh, for a particular stream. I can always uh, navigate to stream. Say, where's the peak? Um, and I can do two. In this particular case, I'm doing persistency of the stream. I can say uh, my users filtered. Because up to the point, up to this point, I'm not. I'm just doing things in my Java application. I'm not touching Kafka here. So only at the point where I actually do two, it actually will be sending it into Kafka topic. But I don't need to do this because I'm using framework. Again, this is back to our conversation. Like you could use Kafka streams out of the box, or you can use Spring Kafka that will simply inject a stream builder in your code, and you can do everything yourself. You can do like a two particular stream manually. See, here I'm using framework and I'm asking framework to inject because in future I might change the topology. It might be going not in the filter, it might be going to the different topic. So I will be able to kind of like a mix and match and build this topology and maybe move this around. And this particular code might go before something or after something if I will write another one. So um, another last thing that I need to have here, oh, snap, I don't have it in my, um, in my playbook, but I don't. Ha I do have it in my um, in my GitHub. So essentially, what I need to have here is a configuration for for Spring Cloud Stream. So first of all, I need to specify that um, I'm gonna be using um, where I'm specifying this. So based on this configuration, and thanks f to a Spring Boot Auto configuration, I will be um, I will be able to get this um, um, binder instantiated by framework. So once uh, my configuration will be uh, interpreted by, by Spring Framework, it will find this particular binding, uh, binder, in this particular case, Kafka Streams binder. Um, I will pass some of the configuration here because I will be using my um, uh, uh, 
uh, Avro as, as a message. And after that, I will be doing all this stuff. Uh, how much time do I have? I'm already losing, losing, losing time because I love talking about this stuff, as you uh, might see. Uh, let me quickly show you the uh, final bits. Uh, I'm not going to be... Um, uh, let me deploy this to uh, PKS and show you. Um, not PKS, uh, Cloud Foundry. So, um, in my Kafka Avro. Okay, so first of all, um, let's see. Uh, CF apps. Do you have any apps here deployed? No apps found. So, uh, for my applications, a couple things that you can find. You can find this manifest YAML. Uh, I would kind of could create the separate Java jar for, um, for each and every module, but I was too lazy. I just have it in one. But the cool thing that Spring allows me to run multiple, uh, multiple uh, Spring Boot applications that deployed within one jar. So in this case, if I'm providing this environment variable saying that um, instead of my, uh, this is going to be my uh, public static void main. And one of the parameters here is a loader main. So in this case, it will load for one application. It will load my producer and consumer. For second one, it will load my Kafka Streams application. So I'm specifying a build pack explicitly because I want my deploy to happen fast. And this is my Java application. I don't need to uh, tell Cloud Foundry to go to find all possible things. Just deploy uh, whatever I have. This is my jar. My jar includes all dependencies. Uh, this is how we deploy in these days, right? So it's uh, like a fat jar. Everything is there. And a couple things here. Um, our um, application will depend on this particular service. And this service that already Arjit showed, um, we have uh, some service that defined inside my instance. And this service will be using Kafka that deployed in PKS. So in this particular case, I will be using dependency injection in my kind of like infrastructure dependency injection. Um, once I define the user defined service, uh, I will be using this environment variable and uh, inject uh, bootstrap services, scheme registry URL, and my SASL uh, JAS configuration file. So I will be able to connect to my Kafka cluster. Another thing that you might notice here, since I'm running this into um, against a, a, a Kafka cluster that provided by operator, we're also enforcing some of the best, or I guess like sane defaults, let's say. Not the best practice, but sane defaults. In this particular case, um, we're talking about, uh, it's not, it's not going to be uh, like fully without password. So in this particular case, it will be using SASL with plain text uh, over, so our, we're not going to be using SSL or TLS for that matter. We're going to be using just simply uh, SASL login and password. Um, you will not be able to connect to this cluster just like with standard tools because uh, using some of the secret, secret passwords. Now, um, another thing, we, uh, once we're creating this cluster in Kafka by operator, it will be actually enforcing some of the defaults. In particular case, uh, you cannot create topic with like uh, replication factor less than three um, and things like that. So um, creating this one, let's call it uh, Victor users because it's environment where we have multiple run. If you will try to do this, I do not forget change the topic name to your own because uh, you're running against the Kafka cluster that m many other people might have access. Let's actually see. Um, inside the control center, I can see some topics. And I see what Ajit did his homework. He actually tried to run this application. Um, uh, and uh, this is my stuff. I also did my homework here. Now, uh, how you can run this in my... Where is the readme? Inside the readme, you can have instructions how you can run this. Uh, first thing, uh, Maven verify, right? Uh, skipping test. Uh, stay tuned for, uh, for my testing talk. Build this next. Um, I already have this uh, user provided service. Next thing is that I'm going to be pushing. I can do this just once because uh, like once and first time I'm pushing this, I need to bind.